Good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening, uh, particularly as um, it's almost 40 years since I became ineligible uh, to be a global shaper. But, but it's refreshing and invigorating uh, to be in the company of uh, uh, such a vibrant group of young people. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to uh, is initially give you a little bit of a plug about Sri Lanka uh, and then talk about five themes very briefly which I think need to be addressed if one is to achieve the equilibrium that you're going to spend the next couple of days talking about. So on Sri Lanka, you know, when you work in a central bank, you are preoccupied with stability. You almost have a fetish on stability. So as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, we're in the process of putting in place four clear frameworks to achieve stable macroeconomic fundamentals in this country. We've almost transitioned to a flexible inflation targeting regime as far as having a forward-looking data-driven monetary policy. And a flexible inflation targeting regime gives you a framework also to manage the exchange rate. The exchange rate becomes the first line of defense, the shock absorber in the system uh, to cope with exogenous shocks. So you've got to manage the exchange rate flexibly. So that's the framework for the exchange rate. We are strengthening fiscal rules. The government budget has been the main source of instability in the system in Sri Lanka. So there are certain rules that already exist, the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act, but they lack teeth, and we, they are basically observed in the breach. So we are trying to now give the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act some teeth so that we get um, good fiscal outcomes on a sustained basis. And as far as Sri Lanka's key vulnerability is concerned, it is our external debt dynamics. And there, we've introduced a new Active Liability Management Act in Parliament, which gives us the flexibility and the space and the room to maneuver to build up buffers to manage our external liability. So those are the four frameworks that are being put in place to, to ensure that we get stable uh, macroeconomic outcomes on a sustained basis. And as far as the growth in the economy is concerned, at the moment we are growing below potential. I mean, I think I heard the IMF, new IMF uh, managing director say that 90% of the world is going to have lower growth this year and, uh, than last year. So there's a kind of synchronized slowdown in the global economy at the moment. And we too are growing below potential. But there's a number of things that are being done to strengthen factor markets, land, labor, and capital, to improve the business climate, to make investment promotion more focused, to strengthen trade facilitation so that the cross-border movement of goods and services are facilitated and transaction costs are brought down. And we're also, as part of our trade policy, negotiating a series of trade deals. So that's what Sri Lanka is. And these reforms are being made in a country which is blessed with an extraordinarily good location. We're 20 miles from the, 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 what was until very recently the fastest growing large economy in the world, that's India, and I think growth in India will pick up again. And we have slap bang in the middle of China's maritime silk route. We are equidistant between Europe and the Far East, so we're in a good time zone. We have access to ASEAN and the Middle East and East Africa. So for millennia, Sri Lanka has been a trading hub in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So that is, we want to rediscover our roots and go back to being just that, a major hub in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the whole of the, uh, the policies and programs that are being rolled out are intended to achieve that. So that's Sri Lanka. Uh, very briefly, what are the five themes that I want to quickly run through, which I think require attention if one is to talk about an equilibrium, a balanced equilibrium going forward? One is clearly climate change. We heard, I think, a very articulate and uh, um, 
compelling narrative earlier uh, from your, I've forgotten the name now, I'm getting C now, but your, your global uh, shaper, uh, leader for this region. Um, and uh, there, I think this region, the South Asian region, is particularly vulnerable. In Sri Lanka, we are experiencing uh, extreme weather events with greater intensity and greater frequency, droughts, floods. And the World Bank, in fact, ranked us number four in terms of vulnerability to the effects of climate change in the world. And it's not just Sri Lanka. Sea level rise is going to be a, almost an existential problem for certainly the Maldives, for large parts of uh, Bangladesh, even for Sri Lanka. Water stress is a very major issue already in large parts of India. So when you look around, this is an issue that needs addressing. And up to now, it has tended to be a kind of an add-on. Uh, lots of very good corporate social responsibility stuff being done by the private sector. Governments have some environmental projects. But I, think, but I think it's time that we now mainstream sustainability to all our planning and budgeting within the system. The planning of a country, the budget making exercise has to have sustainability mainstreamed into it. Because it's no longer an add-on. It's got to be very much mainstreamed into everything that we do. Then the second theme that I'd like to talk about is clearly the fourth industrial revolution. And that's something, again, that's going to affect all of us. And the pace of change is accelerating exponentially. And I suspect in 10 years, we'll be living in a world that's unrecognizable today, uh, given the speed at which things are changing. And there, I think the challenge is going to be how we make the fourth revolution work for as many people as possible. We're going to have, have the capacity to create unprecedented wealth. Globalization over the last 20, 20 years or 30 years has also created an enormous amount of wealth, but that has, it has also created increasing inequality. And I suspect the fourth industrial revolution if it is not managed well, will in fact increase that inequality. Because this wealth can be created by a very small number of people. With robotics, with AI, with machine learning, with the cloud, and with blockchain and fintech in the financial services sector. A lot can be done with very few people. A great amount of wealth can be created with very few with people. So we need, I think, to maintain the focus on wealth creation, but we need a stronger focus on wealth distribution going forward as well. If you look back at the last hundred years, after the Great Depression in the 1920s and 30s, there was higher priority attached to wealth distribution. You had the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the US introduced the New Deal. And then you had the social democracies and the welfare states in Europe. But then in the 70s, the system got stuck. And you had stagflation in large parts of the world. And we moved to a phase where wealth creation became much more important. What we now call as the Reagan-Thatcher era, where there was a very strong push to to create wealth with less of a focus on, on wealth distribution. But we've now probably come to a point where we again need to rebalance to have a better equilibrium between wealth creation and wealth distribution. So how do we do that? Now, of course, there's talk of, of a uni universal basic income to make sure that nobody is left behind. And we will certainly, I think, be able to create enough wealth to be able to afford a universal basic income, to ensure that everybody can live with dignity. But also, uh, uh, the, the kind of third theme 
I would add, at least the fourth theme that I'd like to talk about is skilling the workforce. And this is a theme that's key for young people. I think it's going to be more and more important to focus on education, training, and skills development, which is going to enable people to participate in this new economy that is being created almost day by day. I think one needs to align the education, training, and, and skills development system to the labor market and through the labor market to the comparative advantage of each country. So you start with the comparative advantages of each country. What are the growth sectors? What are the sectors that are going to be able to create new high-value employment? Then you come back to the labor market to make sure that you have the kind of skills that you need for those sectors, and you then roll back into the, uh, the education and training system to ensure that you are able to deliver those skills. So I think we need to be much smarter in the way we do our education, training, and skills development. I think the Singaporeans probably are the best at this. They're very forward-looking. They're able to look at new waves that are coming up and to ensure that their population is geared up to take advantage of it. And we need to more and do more and more of that. The final thought that I would like to leave with you as uh, this is a South Asian Global uh, 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 Shapers Forum is that South Asia is the least integrated region in the world. Whether you look at trade, you look at investment, South Asia comes at the bottom of the pile as far as integration is concerned. We are beginning to see change. If you look at the northeast of the subcontinent, you can see that there's progress being made in terms of transit between India, Nepal, India, Bangladesh. You are beginning to see arrangements in terms of managing and sharing water. You're beginning to see arrangements in terms of power, uh, whereby there's a sharing. Uh, Bhutan, with its hydro energy, is also being linked into the linked into the uh, uh, into the into the network that you are getting uh, in the northern part of the subcontinent. So we are making some progress, and here in Sri Lanka, we are negotiating. We already have a bilateral free trade agreement in goods. India is our biggest trading partner, but we are now trying to negotiate a broader, comprehensive economic partnership agreement which is going to cover not only goods, but also services, investment, training, uh, and, and technology. Um, and so, really, I think we are beginning to move in the right direction. But despite these great civilizational links that we have in this region, which go back millennia, somehow we, have, we are at the bottom of the pile when it comes to taking advantage of integration. Other regions have done much better and have been able to uh, create wealth and, and, and livelihoods for their people to a far greater extent uh, than we have. But as I said, we seem to be moving in the right direction and we need to press on uh, with that. And you see, there is a possibility now um, of recreating in South Asia what happened in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Because when first Japan and then China grew and took off, all the countries in that region were able to plug into supply chains and they pulled up as these two large economies grew and prospered. Now, we're beginning to see the Indian economy um, attain a different plateau of growth and development. And this, hopefully, going forward, will give opportunities for the other countries, the smaller countries in the region, to plug in to India's supply chains, particularly if the Make in India strategy gains great attraction as we go forward. That should create opportunities for other countries to take advantage of supply chains that are created by um, growth of manufacturing in India. The other thing is now, from a Sri Lankan perspective, we've had proximity. We always say, well, we're just 20 miles from this market of 1.2 billion people. But historically, the infrastructure in both countries has been so poor that proximity was near, not really an advantage. 
because poor roads, poor ports, poor airports increase transaction costs. So even if you're just 20 miles away, it wasn't really economic to do business, uh, to have to plug into supply chains across the borders of uh, India and Sri Lanka. But now, with infrastructure improving in both countries, proximity is going to have a higher premium and going forward it's going to be an advantage, certainly for Sri Lanka. So these are some of the opportunities there are. Um, but the point I should conclude with is if you look at each of these themes, whether it's climate change, whether it's the fourth industrial revolution, whether it is taking the lead in creating a new world which is fairer and which, is, which ensures that nobody is left behind, whether it is in terms of acquiring skills for a dynamic future, whether it is to drive regional integration and to drive away some of the prejudices that have held back our region for 70 years or, eight or more, it is the young people who are going to be taking the lead in all these things. So I think the future is in your hands. My generations have done okay, but we could have done a lot better. But you folks have a great opportunity. I hope you will grasp it with both hands. Thank you all very much. <laughs>